This is drug laws in the U.S. Um, for Business Law 550 at Xavier University. So today we're going to go through the history of drug laws in the United States, the current state of dr changing drug laws and proposals, uh, the arguments for and against existing drug policies. We have some questions to present to the class, and then we have a summary in our record. So brief history of drug laws in the United States. Uh, before the early 1900s, people could buy cocaine and syringes and other opiates over the, over the counter. Um, then in 1909, the Smoking Opium and Exclusion Act was the first federal law enacted to ban recreational use of opioids. Uh, after that was passed in 1914, Congress issued the Harrison Act, which allowed for the government to regulate and tax the production, importation, and distribution of cocaine and other opiates. Go forward a little bit further, um, 1960s and Nixon's war on drugs, this is really kind of where our story begins. Uh, there's a big spike in drug abuse during the 1960s, and Nixon led an initiative uh, and increased federal funding for drug control agencies. In addition, he proposed strict measures for crime related for drug-related crimes with the adoption of mandatory sentencing. The Controlled Substance Act was signed by Nixon in 1970, and this enabled the regulation of certain drugs. So. The CSA also classified drugs into five different categories, uh, from Schedule One drugs, which are the most addictive, uh, to Schedule Five. So Schedule One includes things like marijuana, heroin, LSD, um, and Schedule Five includes things like like cough medicine that might have a little bit of codeine um, or, or other types of solution in it. Nixon also created the DEA during his time, uh, which is an agency today that enforces, um, you know, it's the Drug Enforcement Agency, and they have over five thousand agents and a budget of over $2 billion. In 1980, President Reagan kind of revamped uh, Nixon's war on drugs with the Just Say No campaign, which I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with. I mean, he focused on drug crimes, which led to the incarceration of a lot of people. Uh, additionally, Congress passed the Anti-Drug Abuse Act in 1986, which went on to establish minimum sentencing requirements for certain drug-related crimes. So the origins of mandatory minimum drug sentencing, uh, we kind of look to 1973 and Governor Rockefeller addressed New York's rampant drug problem. These were known as the Rockefeller drug laws and they were the harshest, severe, and most mandatory penalties for narcotics across the country. Uh, as the years followed, Rockefeller laws became the template that a lot of other states used. These laws circumvent the discretion of a judge by applying mandatory minimum sentencing. So. These drugs kind of put, or sorry, these laws put drugs and, and drug abuse into uh, severe objective discretion as opposed to um, kind of the subjective discretion that a judge could use. It was really politically attractive to those who wanted to appear tough on crime, but the results kind of clogged the court system. There's tons of incarcerations, uh, which led to Buzz It Strange, and it honestly didn't have much effect on lowering drug use across the country. In 1991, uh, this is the pendulum swung back a little bit in the other way, starting with Families Against Mandatory Minimums. Uh, they were the first organization to step up against politically popular mandatory minimum trends. So FAM focused on getting legislation passed that would give back control to federal judges in order to give them greater discretion in sentencing low-level, nonviolent, first-time drug offenders. The common elements of drug reform legislation included creating or expanding drug courts, providing treatment as an alternative to incarceration, and redefining and reclassifying drug offenses in criminal statute. Health statistics show that whites and African Americans use marijuana at roughly the same rate, which means that the disparity in arrests is driven by not by use, but by racial profiling, which isn't a huge theme of our presentation, but it kept coming up in our research, and so we really wanted to mention it. While tough on crime laws originated from the East Coast and Governor Rockefeller, uh, the counter movement came from California. So in 2014, Proposition 47, California reclassified all drug possessions from a felony to a misdemeanor. At the time, they were the only state that allowed for retroactive resentencing to all those already serving to people already serving time. Since California proposed Proposition 47 in 2014, four other states have passed similar laws downgrading drug possession uh, from a felony to a misdemeanor. The results of this, um, you know, Colorado 
took a little bit of a different approach by singling out and legalizing marijuana in 2012. The total number of marijuana arrests increased by 52%, uh, but the marijuana arrest rates for African American uh, is still nearly double that of whites, even though Colorado is 84% white, which again, we, we just found that interesting. Um, and there's definitely a, a racial and socioeconomic disparity between legalizing drugs. Uh, Washington, D.C., again, they legalized it, but an African American was still 11 times more likely to be arrested for public consumption than a white person. You hear a lot in the news and in articles about the positive economic impact of the legal of marijuana legalization, um, but most of the states ha that have legalized marijuana have made it hard for anyone with a criminal record to really enter that business and capitalize on it. Uh, one of the reasons is because small business loans are usually reserved for people without drug convictions, and a prior arrest for simple drug possession shuts out a lot of people from entering this world. Uh, the end result, you know, again. Uh, the, the main demographic of people that are invested in this are Caucasian. So uh, another interesting thing of note is uh, John Boehner, who at one time backed the war on drugs. And once he was out of office, he joined the board uh, for a cannabis company in 2018. This uh, brings us to the First Step Act, which was legislation signed by President Donald Trump on December 21st, 2018, and made big changes to treatment and rehabilitation of low-level federal prisoners. This was hailed by supporters as a pivotal moment uh, and kind of an unlikely alliance between President Trump and the American Civil Liberties Union. Uh, this, was, this is supposed to bring sweeping changes to the federal prison system and could allow tens of thousands of inmates to be released over the next 10 years. Uh, you qualify mostly, it's mostly people who have committed low-level drug offenses. Uh, and those people can apply and earn credits to be released from prison early and serve the remainder of their sentence either in a home or a halfway house. Uh, as long as they participate in some type of program, such as training or education or faith-based. The Bureau of Prison and Congressional Budget Office estimates roughly 53,000 prisoners could be released over the next 10 years. Po from the political standpoint, it has faced some resistance. Uh, Republicans regarded as menace to public safety uh, with the release of all these prisoners, and some Democrats think it, it's a little more cosmetic than it is consequential. The arguments for reforming existing drug laws. Uh, by legalizing drugs, society stands a much better chance of eliminating the black market drug trade. This would create you know, federally regulated market for drug use that would provide much better assurance of safe products uh, coming into the hands of consumers. And it would allow the government to collect tax revenue from drug sales, which would be put towards you know, addiction treatment, education, and other societal needs. According to Gallup, two-thirds of adults currently favor the legal legalization of marijuana for recreational use, so it's kind of already the, the general consensus that people are okay with marijuana being legalized. By legalizing drugs, there'll be a lot less crime to prosecute and to prosecute and criminals to punish, so by reducing the number of defendants in criminal trials for drug offenses, the police and courts will be freed up to pursue more serious crimes. Uh, and because drug crimes disproportionately affect African Americans and the poor, Legalizing drugs will eliminate the pathway that allows African Americans and poor people to come into contact with the criminal justice system to start with. Now, there are a lot of arguments against, again, that's why we chose this topic. Uh, you know, there, there are some concerns about the moral obligations, like what message are we saying out about the safety of drugs. Um, but it will likely reduce the price over time, which may, may lead to greater addiction for both families and governments to cope with. Uh, so on an individual level, uh, it'll be harder for, for families and people, and from a government level, it could lead to more problems. Although the majority of public sentiment is moving ever greater towards legalization, lawmakers are a little more conservative, and risk aversion uh, is, they're more on the side of risk aversion. It's clear that for states like Colorado and Washington, you know, there, there are some benefits. Um, Washington made like $319 million, and Colorado made $266 million. But there is concern that this increased revenue doesn't outweigh the increased societal costs that may potentially come from greater drug use and widespread addiction. So we really want to focus on you know where you guys stand on this issue. Uh, we want to kind of hear from the people who are more on the get tough on crime laws like Rockefeller with its mandatory minimum sentencing and class classification of drug possession as a felony. And if you guys think that was effective... Uh, what do we think some of the benefits of reducing the severity could be? 
Uh, how far should these reductions go? Is there a certain drug that people are in favor of, a certain drug that we think is too far? What type of punishment and what type of relief is too far? What data would you use and what would you like to see in order to better understand the issue and its impact on society? The use of illicit drugs, you know, we would never condone or recommend the legalization of, with the exception of marijuana. This is kind of our, our personal, our group's decision. Uh, our recommendation arises out of an understanding that an orderly system of legal drug distribution and illicit use will have notable advantages for both users and non-users over the present marijuana black market distribution. Uh, it'll, be, it'll separate channels for marijuana distribution from heroin channels and other illicit drugs. The commission could be used uh, with needed information. Uh, they would monitor the state plan and use the best features of those plans to institute federal marijuana legislation. The tax proceeds should be devoted primarily to drug research, drug education, and other measures specifically designed to minimize the damage done by illicit drugs. And the imprisonment of marijuana users hasn't really curbed marijuana smoking, so uh, that's another reason. Again, I hope you guys flip back to that questions of the class slide, and thank you for listening to our presentation.